to <laughs> figure it out, everything that I do. Uh, indeed, uh, I'm going to be talking about single molecule techniques, of which I've spent, uh, hate to admit it, a few decades on. And uh, now I'm largely using the techniques to look at neurons and in most recently to look at brain slices. And we'll go through that in some detail. And the idea is we're going to do it at nanometer resolution, which has not been done before. Oh. And okay, I don't, ah, there we go. Okay. And the various techniques are named Fiona, Storm, Paint, Minflux, et cetera. And we'll go through them. And also equally important is new fluorescent probes, which are very specific. And I do not take any credit for this. This is de developed largely by my Japanese collaborators who have been very generous with it. And the new fluorescent probes have been monovalent for what is called AMPA, and we'll discuss what AMPA is. Also, let me just say, if there are any questions during the talk, I greatly appreciate you raising your hand, well, I guess raising hands doesn't work. Let me know, and I'll be happy to talk about it. Okay. So we're looking at the brain. There's something like 100 billion neurons. A neuron is a nerve cell. There's a region called the hippocampus, which is sort of like the brain center of your brain. And there are many millions of neurons there. Each neuron is connected not just to one other neuron, but to many of them. In fact, typically a neuron can be labeled, can be, I'm sorry, connected to anywhere from, well, really a thousand to 10,000 other neurons. And they're connected in what's called a synapse. The synapse is very small between nerve one. And is my cursor not working? Oh, there we go. Um, the synapse over here is from nerve one to nerve two. And there's actually a space, very narrow, about 30 nanometers across. So if you want to look at what these two proteins, or many proteins actually are doing across the synapse, it's difficult. In fact, if you go and label protein one with one color, protein two with another color, and you take a look at it with regular, what is called diffraction limit resolution, you get a mess. If, however, you use one of the new techniques, which I'll talk about, that allows you to get super resolution, then you can see, in fact, that they're well distinct. And in fact, right there is the synaptic cleft. And in fact, not only that, but in fact, you can see it in three dimensions. And so, the conclusion is you need to look at live neurons, you need to look with nanometer resolution, and as a function of dynamics and some pathology. Okay, so what we're going to start is with a technique that we called Fiona. 
And it stands for, rather than the character in the movie, Shrek, it stands for fluorescence imaging with one nanometer accuracy. And indeed, it gets on the order of a nanometer accuracy from anywhere to one to 500 milliseconds. It's important to understand this in order to be able to look at neurons. The idea behind it is really quite simple. Imagine macroscopically that you're looking at a single mountain. The mountain may be a half a mile wide, but you can tell where the center is very accurately, much more accurately than the width. Oops. Sorry. It's not going. Okay, there we go. And this is the same thing that you have on the microscopic level. In the microscopic level, here you have a single fluorescent molecule, which is emitting. The, the width of that emission is about 250 nanometers, or lambda over two, where lambda is the wavelength of the emission. So 500 nanometers is green, divided by two is 250 nanometers. But if you have enough photons, you can clearly tell where the center is, just like an up here, to very good accuracy. How good is that accuracy? The center, it turns out, can be located to about the width, that is 250 nanometers, divided by the square root of n, where n is the number of photons. So if you have like 10,000 photons, 250 divided by the square root of 10,000, the square root of 10,000 is, well, I guess I can't force you to, to know, but who knows? Okay, it's, it's 100. So 250 divided by 100, or it turns out it's actually the width, it, it, the uncertainty in the center is the width divided by two times the square root of n. So 250 divided by two times the square root of 10,000 is about 1.3 nanometers. And that's in fact what we showed. Okay, now you want a certain advance, advance on this technique in that you want to be able to look at many fluorophores. And the way you do that is with a technique called POM or STORM, which in fact won the Nobel Prize in 2014. And th this is how it works. If you have the two molecules are well apart from each other, they're resolved. Well apart means much bigger than the point spread function or the, the width, which is about 250 nanometers. As they come closer together, it becomes hard to resolve them. And in fact, comes close enough and you can't resolve them. At least you can't resolve them with standard microscopy. However, if you do something clever, that is, you take the fluorophores and you turn them all off, you see nothing. Then what you do is either with some light or some chemicals, you turn one of them on. With one of them on, you can determine the center to on the order of some number of nanometers, depending on the number of photons that you get out. After a while, it bleaches. You turn another one on. You determine that to some number of nanometers. And voila, there you have these two molecules were labeled with the fluorophores are resolved to a certain number of nanometers. So that's the whole idea. Now, what is it about neurons that we're interested in doing? What we're interested in doing is looking at the AMPA receptors, also somewhat the NMDA receptors, 
And these are really important in terms of memory and learning and so forth. In general, the more AMPA receptors that you have in the synaptic cleft area, the better you are at remembering or whatever. And the AMPA receptors, they tend to aggregate in here due to some memory or something. But after a while, you tend to forget about it. And what you can say is that the AMPA receptors have moved away either inside or to the outside. So we would like to determine what the number of AMPA receptors are. And as a function of training or learning, and as a function of Alzheimer's or simply forgetting. So the idea is we're going to label what's called the PSD, postsynaptic density, a protein in here, just so we know where the synapses are. And then we're going to label the AMPA receptors with different fluorophores. Initially, we used what are called big quantum dots. Then we use small quantum dots. And in fact, nowadays, we often use just regular fluorophores. OK, so we need to study with three-dimensional super accuracy and or super resolution with small photostable probes. We need to label live cells. And we need to determine the position of the proteins in the synapse. So that's our task. OK, and first what we did is we labeled the AMPA receptors with what we call the small quantum dots. We labeled this postsynaptic density with a protein called HOMER1, and we labeled that as well. And then we took a look. And we can actually do it in three dimensions. And what we saw over here in blue is the HOMER, in red is the AMPA. So as we expected, the AMPA was largely inside around the cleft. And in fact, it was diffusing around. That was the situation with the small quantum dots. Then, in fact, we did the same thing with the super small fluorescent probes. And this is what it looked like. In effect, here's the synapse. Here's the AMPA receptor. And we could see that it moved around. OK, so now we want to see learning or forgetting and so forth. And basically what that is is the amount of synaptic AMPA receptors. That is, there's a certain amount. You get some experience. You find that there are more AMPA receptors around the synapse. There's a process often called long-term potentiation, which is basically an increase in the number of AMPA receptors. So we want to see, can we see this? And can we actually determine the number of AMPA receptors? And the other aspect is forgetting that there's an initially, let's say, a large number of AMPA receptors here and then they go away, they decrease. And can we see that? OK, right now, what we're going to do is just simulate it 
ultimately we want to actually train, for example, a, a mouse. But for now, well, we're going to simulate it by some chemistry. So again, initially what you have is you have some an intracellular AMPA, you, all, you have some surface AMPA, you label this with, for example, a red dye, which does not label the intracellular. So you count the number of red dyes, then you have it undergo training, or in this case, some chemistry, the number of AMPA receptors increase and you label it in green. And that ratio is what sort of counts. Okay, and there it is. So again, before, you do anything, you label it in green, and then afterwards you label it in red. And what you want to do is it turns out that there are, there are several different types of AMPA receptors. They're called GLUA1, GLUA2, A3, and A4. And it's, it is believed in general that A1 and A2 form a complex. So you have A1 and A2, and then either another A1, A2, or some other ones. What we found, in fact, the number of GLUA1 presynapse, pre, pre I'm sorry, pre-memory, is actually surprisingly small. It's only about 12. And then when you do LTP, you add another six of them. And in fact, with GLUA2, you have 22 and you add 12 of them. And in either case, you get about 50% increase. So I should say that their amount of GLUA1 and GLUA2 are not equal to each other, which is somewhat of a surprise. Although recently, there was a paper from Arago in Science, which actually found that, yes, they were not equal to each other. And in fact, A GLUA3 was a predominant factor in this. Okay. So now we're going to, at least for the moment, look at brain slices. Initially, what I was talking about was dissociated neurons. Now we want to look at brain slices. So you basically a brain slice is you have a brain and you chop it up, you slice it, and then you look at those slices. Why do this? Well, because brain slices are more physiologically relevant. They have the complete set of all the proteins associated with the neurons. And they also allow for aging and pathology studies that dissociated neurons have a lot of trouble with. But there's problems with it. One, is it's very hard to label only those AMPA receptors on the surface of the neurons and not inside. Second, there's high tissue autofluorescence and out-of-focus fluorescence in, sick, in thick samples. Thirdly, there is a lot of trouble at looking at not just the surface, but in fact, looking at the, the neurons deep inside. Okay, the first thing is we did, we labeled the surface via a fluorophore that was developed by our Japanese collaborators. 
And it's really amazing. This is, for example, the AMPA receptor. You go and you add a small ligand attached to a fluorophore. You let it react. It's amazingly selective. It only acts or reacts with the AMPA receptors. In fact, it turns out it will react with GLUA2 or GLUA3 or GLUA4. It reacts and then most of it leaves, leaving only the fluorophore on the external part, uh, the external AMPA receptors. And in fact, again, this is not my work. This is the Japanese work, and they've tested it with antibodies, and basically it works extremely well. Okay, so what happens is it turns out we take the live brain, and then while the brain is still alive, we chop it into, uh, no, I'm sorry, you add the, the chemical, it reacts over a couple of hours, and then you chop it up. Okay, and then it turns out that there's a lot of complications associated with neurons and brain slices, and I'm not going to go through all of it, although my graduate student has spent years at it. But one thing he uses is he uses high-low illumination, that is, the standard thing is called epifluorescence right over here. Turns out that gives a lot of autofluorescence. So he comes in at a fairly extreme angle. Although it's not so extreme that you can't see up to like 100 microns into the surface. Okay, and there's a number of other things. Okay, and, and this is, in some senses, what my graduate student Rohit has spent a few years doing. First, what he does is he labels a single neuron, and he labels it with a YFP yellow fluorescent protein, and that's all over here. And in fact, the YFP, you can see over here and over here and over here, and so forth, is congregated in these generally little mushroom slides, uh, sized objects, and that's in fact where the synapses are. And in fact, he then labels it with this special dye, which you show in blue, and he also labels it with another dye. This is in the post-synapse. And you, one can see over there, there's one, and here there's two, and here there's three. And importantly, well, the, the YFP is not imaged with super resolution, although we'll talk about that in a little bit, the AMPA and the HOMER are in fact labeled and imaged with super resolution. It gets about 15 nanometers. And what you can do with that is you can look at the AMPA as it, it's sitting in the synapse. And what you find is, in fact, that there are in what is called nanodomains. That is, with a cross-section about 40 nanometers, you get a lot of AMPA receptors, and then little. And then over here, you get a lot, and so forth. And in fact, this has been studied fairly extensively recently, and indeed, people pretty much do believe in the nanodomains, although 
this is the first time that they have ever been seen in a thick slice. Okay, you can also look at the synapses and the spines and notice that some of them are of different shapes. Some are very long, some are short mushroom type and so forth. And it is believed that synapses might in fact depend a lot on the shape. And in fact, we can see that also. We can see that some are mushroom shaped, some are spiny and so forth. Now, one thing about this is I noticed, I, I, I said that the YFP is done with normal resolution. So the question is, can we see it somehow with super resolution? And of course, I wouldn't be asking this if the answer wasn't yes, although it turns out that the AMPA and Homer, we can get to like 13 nanometer resolution. The YFP, we can get to about 60 nanometer resolution. And the question is how to do it. And the answer is a new technique called super resolution radial fluctuations, SRRF. And basically what it, it is, is it's a computational approach you, where you take the normal fluorescence image and you take it over a certain period of time and you can actually get on the order of 60 nanometers. By the way, for those of you who are sort of real experts in this, there is another way where you can get a super resolution image to about 60 nanometers, and it's called structured illumination microscopy. And it turns out that that's a very good technique, though it, it involves a lot more optics. And in our case, we have a lot of optics going on. And so to do that is, is a royal pain. So with SRRF, however, we can actually do that. And this is what we have. And this is the wide field, normal epifluorescence. This is SRF. Notice the spines and the synapses are much clearer. And in fact, we've taken some SIM just to act as a comparison. And the results are really very similar. Now, we haven't done this yet on all of the spines and so forth, but we certainly will. OK. So we've talked about CAM2 labeling AMPA. Question is, can we do more? And in general, with the super resolution techniques that we've talked about, it's very difficult to quantitatively get the numbers of AMPA receptors. I know I did tell you about the ones that went from 12 at then added six, but we, we can discuss that. It, it was sort of a fairly unusual situation. So what we can do, <coughs> excuse me, we can use another super resolution technique called paint. Paint stands for, I don't know, some it's, it's terrible points accumulated after something, something, something. But the important point is you can get the absolute numbers of the AMPA subunits. So in this case, for example, you have your target and 
you make a transfected Docker. That is, you make some piece of DNA or peptide and you attach it, in this case, to AMPA receptors. And then what you do is you add in some imager and the imager has the complementary DNA or peptide such that it will tend to go and bind. And when it binds, because it's fluorescently labeled, it will light up. Because it lights up, you do it at fairly low concentration. You can once again determine what the center is, and you can get very accurately, you can figure out where this AMPA receptor or any other protein that you're looking at is. And then you just do it again. It comes off and another one binds and you can do it again and then again and again and again. And the big thing about this is, again, if you have a certain, let's say one there, it will bind for a certain period of time and then displace and then bind displace. However, if in fact you have two or three or many of them, you'll get a binding and the displacement will be much different than this. In fact, the bindings will be the same, but the displacements will not. And in fact, the number of receptors, for example, will just be this ratio of tau sub d star divided by tau sub d. And that is in fact exactly what we've done. Here we have a, a, a special antibody to glue A1, although the antibody, it, for those of you who are familiar with, is called an SCFV, a very small, in this case, it's about, um, I think it's about 15 kilodaltons, where a regular antibody is 150. So it can, the SCFV can fit in places where the antibody cannot, which is really quite significant because remember the synaptic cleft is on the order of 30 nanometers or so. So what we did once again is we looked at the number of glue A1s and we looked at the number of glue A2s. And we could definitely determine exactly how many of the glue A1s and how many of the glue A2s there are. And you see the glue A1 has on the average of 75 and the glue A2s have an average of 147. Clearly, these are not one-to-one. -one. In fact, they're close, very close to two to one. So again, this is quite clearly indicating that there's some other AMPA receptor coming on and binding to the glue A1s. In fact, Eric Guido uh, suggest, or more than suggested that it was the glue A3. Not only can we do the paint on fixed neurons, but in fact, we can do them on live neurons. The advantage of this is you can get dynamics. So you can look at the diffusion or you can look at the diffusion as a function of position. In this case, we look at the synaptic receptors, glue A2 and glue A1, 
and also the juxtasynaptic that is nearby but not on the synapse. And again, here we see that they're similar, though clearly they are not the same. Again, indicating that there's some fraction of the molecules which are independent. That is, they're not simply GLUA1 and GLUA2. Okay, and well, it, I, I won't go through a lot of details, but basically what you can do is you can use this little docker, the docker being made, the docker and the imager. Most commonly, they're made of DNA, which hybridizes and dehybridizes, though it turns out that what we've shown is you can use them as peptides. Peptides is, a com is convenient to use because it's very easy to make an extra peptide hanging off of an AMPA receptor, for example, in a, a cloned AMPA receptor. And as you can see, it works out very well. Okay. What I'm going to tell you about just for a minute is really something completely separate. And that is called MinFlux, which is a very special microscope, which is now in the IGB, which is open to all who you use it. And the amazing thing about it is you can measure the distance with like one nanometer accuracy in less than a millisecond. And for example, you can label them with dyes, which are very close in emission spectra. Okay. And what you can do here is you can actually measure, for example, measure the bas bassoon, that's a protein in the presynapse, and you can measure all the way to GLUA2 over here. And in fact, so the distance you're measuring is the distance of the synapse plus whatever the extra distance is over here. So uh, we, we've just started these kind of measurements, but it's, it, it's a really an awesome microscope. And by the way, it's a microscope that is again, come out from the 2014 Nobel Prize winners because uh, Stefan Hell was the person who invented this. Okay. And uh, I guess I want to thank the people who actually have done the work because I just get the joy of talking about it. And occasionally while they're doing it, I, I complain that they're not doing this or doing that. And um, in particular uh, is Rohit, who is the graduate student who is responsible for the brain slices. He's just done an absolutely amazing job. There is Barun, who was a postdoc, who uh, did the peptide paint. There's Yeon and Gloria who have done the, the DNA paint. And, um, um, oh, and Duncan also uh, helped out with Barun doing some of the neuroscience. And of course, then there's my dog, 
uh, Finn, who comes in pretty much every day with me. And that's it. Thank you very much. And I see it's 444, so I give you six minutes of questions that you can ask. If you want to ask a question, just unmute your microphone and ask him directly. Paul, oh, thank you. That was, I've heard you before, but this is really an inspiring talk. Great. Um, with the, now what was the name of the very last one where you were doing? Uh, pa paint? Uh or, or the very, this is Mini, min or flux. Min flux, yes. Min flux. Can you do this in real time? How rapidly can you observe it? it? Well, it, it depends. Um, formally, if you if you know where you want to sit, you can basically sit there and you can take data with something like a millisecond time resolution and get on the order of a few nanometers of accuracy. So when you do that, do you see a change in the relationship between the two membranes? Ah, it will. I don't know. Uh, I. It would be interesting know. to figure it, that out. Yeah, the the problem with this is to get the distance between the fluorophores is actually very difficult in any sort of time domain because you can shine uh, uh, I, I actually have to think about this um yeah I, I have to think about it okay okay um I, I, somebody else I saw had their hand up Hyun? Uh, hello, <clears throat> this is Jun. Yeah. Oh, hi, Jun. Thank you so much. Yeah, for the very <clears throat> the nice the results and uh, the presentation. One thing I'm curious is that uh, you showed actually a good tools with the live style imaging. So I wonder if you had a chance to use that technique to monitor the change of the, the spines in the neurons, like uh, especially when they are exposed to the certain insert, like uh, inflammatory signals. So that could be very interesting. Well, okay. Yes, it's very interesting, though it's very hard. Oh, in, okay. In, in the sense of all of my brain slice work was unfixed. That that is, it, you you take in this case the mouse, the, and then you kill it, yeah. and, and and then while the brain is still alive, you it, inject it with the dye, and so in, in that sense, it's not live. However, let me tell you about something that we're planning on doing, which I'm very excited about, which in some senses comes pretty close to the live. That is, you take a mouse and you intracranially inject the dye. The dye, it turns, they, the Japanese collaborators have actually done this, the dye specifically reacts with the AMPA receptors and mm -hmm. apparently does not hurt the mouse at all. 
So the mouse, and, and it doesn't hurt it for on the order of uh, two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing, so you have the mouse that's labeled with the AMPA receptor, and then you can train the mouse, you know, giving some foot shock or whatever. And then you can inject again with the AMPA receptor with a different dye. And in that case, any time there, there has been LTP or new AMPA coming to the surface, they mm. will be labeled with the new dye. Okay. So, so then you then you kill the mouse and you do the two color experiment. And you should be able to see the AMPA that was initially there and the AMPA that happened to because of the the training. And mm -hmm. I should at, uh, I should add, this has not been done. And furthermore, it was the idea of He Jung Chung, uh, who's my collaborator. And she was, in fact, the one who thought of it. And I, and I at this point, should take a moment to thank her, because basically what I know how to do is certain technology. And she's really the, the brains behind all of the fantastic, what, what I think is fantastic physiology. And in, in this case, the Japanese group um, it, or the chemists involved. So mm. that, that, that's why it's great to be a professor. So all of you grad mm. students, you should learn about this. This is what being a professor is all about, is getting to talk about all of the hard work that the graduate students and postdocs have done. Thank you, yeah. <clears throat> and also this is just uh, one of my ideas like uh, I came up, like uh, in case of our lab, we also actually are collaborating with Martha and Hijong and developing the kind of uh, engineered brain slice using the human like IPS cells throughout the differentiation. And kind of I'm very tempted and very intrigued to use your technique to image this neural network in the engineered like slice. So that could be kind of potential like a direction if you are interested in it. Yeah, that, well, we, we should talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. will email you and then yeah, we'll and, find well, the time, yeah. And of course, He Chung as well. Yeah. It, is there any questions from the graduate students or postdocs? Come on, it, it, you, you <laughs> can ask, you know, ask the stupidest question you can imagine because those are usually the best. All right, well, you can always email me, selvin at illinois.edu, if there's anything that is on your mind. So if there's no other questions, I think everyone wants to just thank you for presenting and I'll be happy to share your email with the grad students and the trainees after the talk. Hey, thank you. Um, Dot, do we want to stay on or you'll contact me later? Um, I'll, I'll contact you tomorrow and we can talk about the options for recording or for posting. Okay, great. Okay. Good. All thank right. You thank you much. so much. Thank you thank again. You. Great well, talk, Paul. But hey, hey, Chunk. <laughs> good things I said, good things about you. <laughs> <laughs> uh.
Bye bye. She she, bye bye. she wrote in the chat thanking you. So you'll have to look at the chat notes. Okay, we'll do. Bye bye. <laughs> bye.